in our scientific journey any hypothesis needs to be experimentally proved in order to go ahead with further scientific findings one such hypothesis which was thought by a famous scientist called de broglie further was proved through certain scientific experimentation and that is the topic of today's video in today's video of quantum mechanics we are going to look into some of the basic foundation and important equation like the einstein de broglie equation the photoelectric effect and the advent of planck's constant we are also going to look into a very important experiment into the history of quantum mechanics which is called the davison germer experiment and how mathematically it proved the de broglie's hypothesis this would be today's agenda in introducing quantum mechanics and we will see through these experiments how wonderfully the de broglie hypothesis has been proved my name is shonak and you're watching this video on my channel physics for students welcome to this new series of video on introducing quantum mechanics first of all let us look what are the topics that we are covering we would be first understand the einstein de broglie relation then we will look into a little bit about the photoelectric effect then we will see how planck's constant came and the famous davison germer experiment which ultimately proved the de broglie hypothesis and the equation of einstein and de broglie how they are intimately related to each other so first we will understand the einstein de broglie equation and how important it plays a significant role in understanding quantum mechanics now the quantum mechanics if we talk is basically made of very two simple deceptively i would say simple formula one equal which is equals to hf uh, which is basically proposed by einstein and the next one which is proposed by de broglie now you see that uh, uh, the most of us we use these two equations and uh, the einstein e equals to hf actually says that a particles energy e is proportional to the frequency f now in 1905 albert einstein proposed a relation for light introducing the radical idea that light comes into discrete lumps right and these are called photons and each with an energy determined by the light's frequency so from here we can say that a blue photon for example uh, which has got a higher frequency has more energy than a red photon which has got a lower frequency while the gamma ray photon uh, has far more energy uh, compared to the uh, either and the radio wave photon has much less and so on so the first uh, direct experimental evidence for the einstein relation came into something which we will look into the next part of our video here it is it is called the photoelectric effect in which high frequency uh, i would say light was aimed to hit at a metal surface which ejects uh, electrons with more energy than low frequency light okay so the photoelectric effect we can call is the emission of electrons when the electromagnetic radiation such as light hits a material electrons emitted in this manner are called photoelectrons and this phenomena is studied immensely in condensed matter physics solid state and quantum chemistry okay so you see that uh, i would say that the uh, the, 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 uh, the when we plot the energy uh, versus the frequency uh, into a kind of a straight line and whose slope is constant to the proportionality we get this and this is what we call is the planck's constant right and it is so famous that it is written on a plaque in german language which states as that max planck who discovered the elementary quantum action h taught here from 1889 to 1928 and the energy uh, gives the relationship between the energy of a photon and its frequency and by the mass energy equivalence the relationship between mass and frequency now uh, the einstein's relation which we have just seen remember it doesn't apply just to particles of light it applies equally well to electrons protons quarks and neutrinos and um, uh, in the later part of the video we will see that how it is so defining what we mean by frequency is one of those particles is a little bit trickier and so uh, let us move now into the next part of the 
hypothesis that is the de Broglie's hypothesis. Now the de Broglie's relation P equals to H upon lambda actually says this that a particle's momentum P is inversely proportional to its wavelength lambda. Now for photons I would say this relation is straightforward. That means uh, for a consequence of E equals to F HF since light wave has P equals to E upon C and we can tell that F equal to C upon lambda where C is the uh, speed of light. But in 1924 Louis de Broglie proposed that every particle has a wavelength that is inversely proportional to its momentum with the same universal constant of proportionality which we have just seen which is called the H. Now remember that the wavelength of a baseball even if we take a for fictitious example like a baseball which has got a large pre is too uh, you know tiny to measure compared to low mass or subatomic particles such as electron which has got a small p it is not difficult to measure so uh, in this way it for in order to measure the wavelength it through a diffraction experiment it was to these two gentlemen clinton davison and lester germer uh, did an accidental, uh, you know, kind of a <laughs> experiment, uh, which uh, do, uh, which uh, after D uh, Louis de Broglie proposed it, and more recent experiments have measured the wavelengths of all sort of subatomic particles, uh, as well as entire atoms and molecules. Now, in the next part of the video, we will just see what was the davison lester germers experiment, which is the diffraction experiment. Not going details into what is called a diffraction but we'll look into it and we'll try to understand how these two gentlemen prove the de Broglie's hypothesis. So in this part of the video we will be dealing what is called the davison germer experiment. Okay, so the davison germer experiment established the wave nature of electrons and validated the de Broglie equation for the first time. It was carried out in Western Electric, now known as Bell Labs. So, de Broglie proposed the dual nature of the matter in 1924, but it was not until that Davison and Germer's experiment confirmed the findings. The findings provided the first experimental verification of quantum mechanics, and we will investigate what it is. And Clinton Joseph Davison uh, actually received the Nobel Prize in 1937 for it. And he was an American physicist uh, who, in 1937, won the famous. Uh, Nobel Prize in Physics for the Diffraction and Lester Halbert Germer was basically a graduate student and Davison shared the Nobel Prize with George Paget Thompson who uh, independently discovered the existence of electron diffraction at about the same time with Davison. Okay, so this is a little bit about the history and this is a very rough, I would say, skeletal diagram of what Davis and Germer proved, but remember this is not a very rigorous thing. So the experimental setup uh, for the Davison and Germer experiment was enclosed within a vacuum chamber. Now the, the deflection and scattering of electron by the medium are prevented and the main parts are this one. First there was something called an electron gun uh, which is a tungsten filament that emits electrons via thermionic emission that is, it emits electrons when it passes to a particular temperature. Then, next was an electrostatic particle accelerator. The two opposite charge plates, positive and negative, are used to accelerate the electrons at a known potential. Then there was something called a collimator. The accelerator is enclosed within a cylinder that has a narrow passage for the electrons along its axis. Its function is to render a narrow and straight, which is called a collimated beam of electrons ready for acceleration. The next was basically the target. The target is nickel crystal. The electron beam is fired normally on the nickel crystal. The crystal is placed such that it can be rotated about a fixed axis. And the last was the detector. Uh, it is used to capture the scattered electrons from the nickel crystal so that the detector can be moved in a semicircular arc uh, just as it is shown in the left hand side figure. So these were the arrangements of I would say uh, a kind of a uh, of the experiment but before we go into that we will take a step back and look into something of a diffraction so that we can understand things better then we will move directly into the experiment. Now this is as a sequence of photographs which I have taken from uh, American Association APT citation 
Now you see that the diffraction experiments with particles are extremely odd. Why? Because each particle can land on the detector in any place. So in this figure, you sh see a sequence of actual photographs from a two-slit interference experiment with electrons with the beam of current increasing from left to right. Now you see at low beam currents, you can see these are the distinct blips or dots left by individual electrons on the detection screen in an apparently random locations. At higher currents, as you can see, the familiar maxima and minima of the interference pattern emerge, allowing us to determine the wavelength lambda of the size of pattern. So what we can say from here, it appears that this lambda, uh, together with the experimental geometry, uh, determines the probability of an electron basically arriving at any particular location. Randomness and probability seem to be inherent in the de Broglie relation and interference experiments with photons which was performed later on uh, yield similar results. La random blitz at low intensity with the wavelength depending pattern emerge at higher intensity. So this is just to show you how the diffraction happens with a kind of a sequence of photographs which are emitted from the left hand side to the right hand side. Okay, now we move to the Davison Germer experiment and we see this kind of a figure. This is prior to the arrangement so that these uh, is, is basically the variation of the intensity on the scattered electrons with the scattering angle theta as obtained from the different accelerating voltages as you can see in the figure. The most important is that by varying the acceleration of voltage from 44 d uh, volt to around 68 volt, right, as you can see I have marked both this in red from 44 to 68 volt, it was noticed that a strong peak appeared in the intensity uh, I of the scattered electron which is around this 54 volt which has got a scattering angle of 50 degrees, this one. So this is something which is prior to experiment. This is how it is arranged. So ranging the intensity from 44 to 50 uh, uh, with this, we get uh, uh, a decent number which is 54 volt. Okay. Now let us consider the electron's mass to be m, the uh, charge of an electron to be e, and accelerated from a rest through a potential p. Then the kinetic energy k of the electron equals to the work done on the electron which is k equals to eb and we know that kinetic energy equals to half mv square and we know that p equals to mb and from here we get ke equal to p square by 2m i mean just 2m yeah it is pretty simple we want this uh, this one so that p equals to square root of 2mk which is more or less equals to 2 2 mev now, the de Broglie wavelength lambda of the electron is given as this. We have just seen that. And from here we get this. Now, if you substitute the value of this one, 2mk, this put the m into here, we get this, right? So, we get h equals to square root of 2mev. So, we are just substituting the value of mk and then this into this. And from here, what we get, substituting the values of h which is the Planck's constant with the mass of the electron followed by the charge of the electron which is in coulombs we get the value as this one 1.227 upon square root of b nanometers right now we turn the page and we know that from the previous uh, figure we get the de Broglie wavelength for electrons with an angle of 50 degrees as 54 volt uh, we have seen this earlier right so from here what we can say is that using this equation which we have just derived, we can substitute the value of square root of E something as this and finally we get this. So what it suggests is that according to the de Broglie wavelength uh, relation, the electrons with kinetic energy of 54 electron volt has a wavelength of 0 0.167 nanometers and which is experimentally more or less equal to 0 0.165 which was earlier due to Bragg's law, I am not explaining that, which closely matched with the relation. So we saw that how the Davis and Germer experiments actually propose the wavelength which is in electron hold, which is this. So uh, when they won the Nobel Prize in physics, they wrote that 
uh, these results including the failure of the data to satisfy the Bragg formula are in accord with those previously obtained in our experiments on electron diffraction. The reflection data failed to satisfy the Bragg relation for the same reason that the electron diffraction beams failed to coincide with the law beam analogs. However, Davison and Germer's accidental discovery of the diffraction of the electrons was the first uh, which he detected and confirmed the de Broglie's hypothesis that particles also can have wave properties as well. Because it, if it would not have wave properties, then how it would meet with the value which was earlier detected by de Broglie with this uh, 54 volt. Okay, lastly, we will just look into what is the Einstein de Broglie relation. So, the similarity of the Einstein and de Broglie's relation, uh, I would say, comes from uh, what we call the period of a wave, which is t equals to 1 upon f. And we know we have got these two values. So, we can say, in other words, energy is uh, uh, to time period as momentum is to space wavelength. We can definitely call this. Alternatively, we can write these terms in relation of the angular frequency that is omega equals to 2, uh, 2 pi f, we, we can call this 2 pi upon t, substituting the values, and the angular wave number we know is k equals to 2 pi upon lambda. Now, for convenience, we usually, what we do is that absorb the value of 2 pi into the reduced Planck's constant, which is the h bar equals to h upon 2, and this gives the value. So, we have now simply E equals to h bar omega and P equals to h bar k. If you really want to look into further, you can just uh, take a snapshot of the screen. So, what we get from here is that this value, this value and this value, all of them ultimately expresses exactly the way physics work and exactly the same physics. So, E equal to hf, P equals to this one earlier where we got the period now h upon t and equals to h bar omega which is angular frequency and p equal to hk expresses the same physics. So here is a quick summary for what we have learned today. Uh, we have looked into Einstein de Broglie relation, the de Broglie hypothesis and most importantly how David Germer proved the de Broglie hypothesis and the relation between these two equations. That's all for today's video. It was short and crisp. I hope you liked it. Please do subscribe to my channel Physics for Students. Click on the bell icon and click on all to get all the notification from Physics for Students. Please do let me know how do you like the video and put up your comments and I will wait for your comments so that I can improve and we will be back again and continue this video series which is on the physics part of quantum mechanics. However, there is a separate playlist which carries on with the mathematics of quantum mechanics that will go on. And this is the physics part of quantum mechanics. It will carry on. Thank you for watching this video and have a great weekend ahead. Goodbye and take care.